Good morning. How was your week? We ask that of each other sometimes, don't we? Or how was your day? And the Apostle Paul is going to uh, tell us what the answer should be. And we're going to begin this morning in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, and the verse that says, Rejoice evermore, short and to the point. The Apostle Paul in this uh, letter to the Thessalonians gave us one of the main reasons that we should be able to do that. And he talks about it in every chapter. And that's what we refer to as uh, the rapture. And uh, if we expect it to happen as they did in their lifetime, then I reckon uh, we can Rejoice evermore. Always be in that state of rejoicing, providing that our heart uh, is right. Uh, but there's a, a danger that we can lose our focus. Uh, things get in the way. We seem to be able to find it easy to rejoice when things are good. But when adversity strikes, then it becomes tough. Uh, it's really tough when we find out uh, the situation we're in, and, and that's when we find out, I should say, that how close our relationship is uh, with the Lord. Um, to rejoice always has to be one of the most uh, difficult things to get a hold of when adversity strikes. However, on the other hand, it's a time when we can experience God's presence uh, the most. And that's when we rejoice through God's strength, the strength the Holy Spirit provides when we saturate ourselves with the Word of God. The Apostle Paul was able to rejoice in his infirmities. The Lord told Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And then in verse 10, he said, therefore, I am content with weakness, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. In uh, Romans 8, 18, the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. The word rejoice here, as the Apostle Paul uses it, is in the form of a command. And that's why in Philippians 4, 3, I believe the reason that he uh, mentions it, repeats it twice. Some parents say to their children, and I know that my mother said to me, if I've told you once, I've told you twice. And Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And I believe it's a, a step above of what we uh, many times refer to as a positive mental attitude. The verse in Philippians says, rejoice in the Lord. I would call that a spiritual a positive spiritual connection. And if you combine that with a positive mental attitude, then I believe we're doing what the Bible calls for, rejoice evermore. Another way to describe ever, uh, rejoice evermore would be to be always joy-filled. The opposite of being always joy-filled is always complaining. And there's a story in the Old Testament that I believe teaches us an important lesson. How to overcome an attitude of complaining to an attitude of rejoicing. And it's a story about Job. Job was a wealthy man and he lived in the land of Uz with his large family and he had very, he had a lot of livestock and uh, he is a blameless, upright man, a God-fearing man. 
And Satan argues with God that Job is faithful only because God has blessed him. And Satan challenges God to be given permission to punish Job. And according to Satan, he will then turn his back on God and curse God. And God allows Satan to torment Job to test him. In the course of one day, Job loses his livestock, all his servants, and his ten children. And Job tears his clothes and he shaves his head in mourning, but Job still blesses God in his prayers. And God grants Satan another chance to test Job. This time, Job is afflicted with terrible sores all over his body. His wife encourages him to curse God and to die. But Job refuses. And then three of his friends show up and they sit in silence in honor of Job's mourning for seven days. And the seventh day, <coughs> Job speaks. He curses the day he was born. His friends do not offer him any encouragement. They, their theory is that Job's problems were brought on by some sin, and they also accuse him of other things as well. And this proves to be too much for Job, and he becomes sarcastic and fearful and impatient. And then God appears, asking Job about creation and explaining his power. Job has three basic complaints. God doesn't hear me, God is punishing me, and God is allowing the evil to prosper. But this encounter with Almighty God brings Job to his senses, so to speak. Job's comes to the end of himself. He acknowledges the sovereign hand of God, and he no longer demands an answer to why those awful things happened to him. And when God acknowledges God's sovereignty over his life, everything he lost is restored twofold. It's Job who said, shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? It's Job who said, though the Lord slay me, I will trust him. He learned the lesson, rejoice evermore. Job kept his faith. He did not turn his back on God. And there's one more thing we can learn from Job. In his gloom, Job hoped for the resurrection. Job 19, 25 and 26. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the later day upon the earth. And verse 26, And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. At this point, we could make a comparison of his earthly hope and our heavenly hope, but we'll save that for another time. But the resurrection was the one thing that put his suffering into perspective. So no matter what we're faced with, we can have the assurance of being in God's presence for all eternity. Someone said, life is short, death is sure, sin the cause, and Christ the cure. Before we move on, let's just take a, a brief look at David. If we read the Psalms, we can see that David had his ups and downs, too. And isn't it good to know that David was a man after God's own heart? He was a great man. He ruled as king for 40 years. He slayed Goliath, the giant. He wrote 77 of the 150 Psalms in the Bible. But David had some problems, too. And some of them he brought on himself. The incident with Bathsheba is just one example. In Psalm 25, 11, David wrote, For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. He cries out to God in Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, wash me from my sin, cast me not away from thy presence, 
Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Create in me a clean heart. And through it all, David is a great example of someone who knew how to rejoice. In Psalm 13, verse 15, David says, I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. David and Job teach us that God is good, that God is in control. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 28, that God will bring good out of every situation, another reason to rejoice. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. And there are those that would tell you that means to pray constantly. That would mean that we only talk to God and not each other. I believe a better understanding uh, would be to be consistent in prayer. And that's reinforced for us in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, where it says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And I like the way it's stated in the New American Standard, devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Job found reason to pray even when he lost everything. In Job 42.10, Job prayed for his friends, and then the Lord restored his fortune. Most of the Apostle Paul's prayers were for the saints, and some were for himself. We won't look at the scripture references this morning, but just quickly summarize the things he prayed for, some of them. He prayed for godly living. He prayed for open doors for ministry. He prayed for strength, for an increase in the knowledge of the Lord, to understand the hope of God's calling, for the riches we have in Christ, for Christians to be in one accord, for Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith, for the fullness of God. And according to the Apostle Paul, the best way we can do this is spend a lot of time praying. And that's what he says in our text this morning in verse 17. Don't stop. Now going on in verse 18, he says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And as far as I know, every translation reads the same. None of them say for everything, but they say in everything. In other words, whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, be thankful. And when we do that, it's proof that we're walking with the Lord. According to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, when we see more and more people that are not thankful, it means that we're living in what the Bible calls the last days. And that being the case, we could be thankful for what the Apostle Paul has been emphasizing in this letter to the Thessalonians, the rapture, that we have not been appointed to wrath. Thankfulness is the key to overcoming anxiety. Thankfulness is the key to obtaining the peace of God, and that's spelled out for us in Philippians 4.6. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And verse seven, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When we pray, be thankful. And we, someone said we can summarize verse 18 like this. We should be anxious for nothing, prayerful in everything, and thankful all the time. When our prayers express gratitude, it means we're relying on the supernatural strength that God provides for us to cope. I remember Paul Sadler talking, or, or rather telling about a, a fellow who worried about everything, and when he didn't have anything to worry about, he worried about that. 
and then he found a way not to worry about anything. He hired a guy to do all his worrying for him, <laughs> and he paid him $500 a day. And someone said, how can you afford to pay $500 a day? And he said, that's his worry. <laughs> so in verse 18, it goes on to say, when we see that praying with thanksgiving, it is the will of God. It's God's will to glorify him by giving thanks. So when we're thankful in all things, it proves that we have a transformed heart. The question is, do our hearts beat with thanksgiving? Is it a regular heartbeat? Or is it a irregular heartbeat? <coughs> if it's an irregular heartbeat, the prescription, the prescribed medicine, is the word of God. A man was one asked what he gained by praying to God on a regular basis. And the man replied, nothing. But let me tell you what I lost. I lost anger, depression, greed, insecurity, and the fear of death. Sometimes less is more. Verse 18 goes on to say, being thankful and everything is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Here we see the prerequisite for being able to carry out Paul's three commands, to be joyful, to pray continually, and to give thanks in everything. Three things that many times go against our nature, our na natural makeup. The prerequisite, of course, is to be in Christ. All we have to do is consider some of the things that we have in Christ. It should make it easy for us to pray with a joyful gratitude. In Philippians 4.19, we're told that God will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15.22, in Christ shall all be made alive. Should the Lord tarry, will be raised from the dead at the coming of the Lord, the rapture. In Ephesians 1.4, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the wor world. Ephesians 1.7, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, in Christ, the righteousness of God is imputed to us. In Galatians 3.26, in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Amen. In Christ, in the Lord, and in him are mentioned 164 times in Paul's epistles. We are united to him like a vine is to a branch, and it's permanently attached, and the branch will never break off. To be in Christ means we are a new creation. We have died to the old life, and we're risen again with Christ to a life that is new. So, brothers and sisters in the Lord, give thanks, for it is the will of God. It is God's gracious design, or we could say it's God's gracious desire. In verse 19, it tells us to not quench the spirit. Quench not the spirit. The word quench, as it's used here, is the same as suppressing fire. The Holy Spirit is like a fire dwelling in each believer. And the question is, is he a flame, or is he like embers that need to be fanned into a flame? There are those who would have us believe that Paul is referring, referring to the sign gifts that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of tongues and so on. The Bible clearly states 
that those gifts have ceased. So that's not where the Apostle Paul is coming from. In fact, 1 Corinthians had not even been written yet. The church at Corinth had not been founded as yet. So what is Paul referring to when he says, quench not the spirit? In 2 Timothy, Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift of God, fan the embers into a living flame, so to speak, in Timothy's case, so that he could carry out the ministry of preaching, teaching, and evangelizing. We also need to understand that the spirit Paul is referring to is not an it, it's not just a force. He is the third person of the Godhead. There is one God manifested in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In this dispensation of grace, the Holy Spirit takes up permanent residence in the life of a believer. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and go, empowering individuals for service. Today, when a person trusts Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live within that person. The word temple in the Old Testament is used to describe the Holy of Holies. God's presence would appear in a cloud and meet the high priest once a year in the Holy of Holies. Today, there is no Jewish temple or animal sacrifices. Today, Christians are the habitation of the Holy Spirit. And according to Ephesians 4.30, he can be grieved. And our verse this morning tells us he can be quenched. The Holy Spirit grieves because we quench. Is that on, there's, it's that ongoing battle within the Christian. We still have the capacity to sin, but the good news is we also have a new capacity to resist sinning. The new nature needs constant renewing. According to Colossians 3.10, the new man is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The Apostle Paul prayed that we would grow in the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The old man is under an old master, Satan, and the new man has a new master, the Spirit of God living within. In Romans 7, Paul explained the battle between the old man and the new man. And then he went on to say in verse, verses 24 and 25, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, who will deliver me from this body of death. In the end, Christ is the one who will rescue us. And one more thing to bear in mind. It's not possible to feed both natures at the same time. The food that feeds one nature will starve the other. The answer is to feed the new man every day with the living word of God. Sometimes I think it helps us to understand the meaning of a word by its antonym. In, in the case of the word quench, the opposite is ignite. By letting the word of God control us, as it says in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's the same as walking in the spirit, as it's stated in Galatians 5.16, walking by faith in God's word under the spirit's control. If we do that, then we will not quench the spirit. It's the Word of God that activates the Spirit's control uh, in our life. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful this morning for what we have in Christ. Help us always to be steadfast in prayer, to always find reasons to rejoice, and always finding reason to be thankful. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.